last time in these medieval chateaus. There's a lot of medieval bric-a-brac, a lot of treasures, a lot of absence of treasures. I mean, anything you like, there's, there's luxurious objects and, and, and the most uh, poverty-stricken kinds of things in Saint-Julien's uh, final uh, little, little hut that he lives in. But those things do not seem to play the same role. Well, when you start to think about that some more, Finally, you come to the conclusion that what the function of this multiplicity of the object world that these tales are interrogating in Saint Julien can only be the animals. These are uh, these represent the whole spectrum of the object world, the great tableau of the whole variety of the species and our control over them and the way in which uh, we, uh, we exercise, our, we collect them, we kill them. It's for Saint-Julien, Saint yeah, naming them and killing them and hunting them, that's all the same, that's a mode of collecting. So, uh, so finally that becomes the equivalent of the object world in these um, in, in, in these, in that, in that story and this then will be about uh, the modes uh, of relationship that we can have to objects, all of which are somehow, all of which are problematic, each one of which is so somehow self-defeating and, and, um, and produces its own kind of inner dialectic. Okay, now, um, obviously the, the, the most fundamental versions of these things are going to be in terms of space um, and we, we began to talk about this uh, already um, in terms of space and also in terms of religion because I do remember that we wanted to talk about that some more and we want to get back to that. Let me just put it this way. The first story, the space of the first story is what I call in this paper referential space, serial space if you like, a space which is space of the quadrillage uh, where everything's equivalent, there isn't any center, uh, and yet everything flees the center anyway. That's the space of realism. Now, what is the space of Saint-Julien? Well, again, leave that aside. Uh, it's easier to deal first with the space of Herodias, because that space is theatrical space, very clearly, from the very beginning. Uh, the, the citadel uh, is placed in the center of space, and there is, if you read the description carefully and you can amuse yourselves by, by looking through again for these things, you have a front and a back. Uh, it is in the center of something, and it has a panorama, and Herod comes and he s stands in the center of this and looks out. So this is theatrical space, which is, which is the, the space of the vanishing points, the perspectival space, the space which has one end in the viewer's um, in the viewer's point of view, and you know how, uh, remember those, all those um, uh, Renaissance durers, I think, uh, descriptions of the, the artist doing perspective where you have, um, you, you place the object here, and then there's a kind of mechanism through which the artist sights the object, and really, uh, perspectival space is impossible because it, it is, it's a kind of ideology. Panofsky shows this in his essay on the, on the thing, because uh, we can never really, there is no point of view this, since we have two eyes, so, so that's a trick. But, uh, but the ideal would be to have a single eye which saw a single viewpoint, which saw the spectacle and united it, and then which projected at the other end of the spectacle the vanishing point, and around the vanishing point then all of perspective is constructed. Well, if I may open a parenthesis, this is, what, this is what one ought to mean if you want to denounce representation uh, as, uh, as a lot of people uh, are doing. Uh, that's what representation really is. Uh, if you look at, at, um, uh, at these, um, that's what mimesis is in its classical sense. It is theatrical representation. Uh, and if you go back through this, I think you can find that the very uh, idea of point of view, perspective, and all of those things comes at once from, from painting. But Renaissance painting, the perspective, the invention of perspective is drawn from another model, and that model is theatrical space. And I can document that. That's Franck Castell has shown that and some other people and so on. So we go back through, we go back through, um, through the visual, and the way the visual organizes all kinds of other things, the, the, the Renaissance city is all based on, on, on paintings. You know. 
uh, and so forth. Well, we go back through that and we end up in the theater. So we end up in an ideology of the spectacle, an ideology of presence, um, an ideology that uh, it is possible to have a point of view from which you see an event, and then an event can be a real life. Well, if you, you can go through this and everything in, in Herodias' spectacle. Salome's dance, the whole uh, arrangement of the dais where they're sitting, uh, the, the, the trinalchium or whatever it is where, um, where, the, 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 where, they, uh, where Herodias comes out. Uh, and of course, it shifts back and forth. That is, sometimes Herod is in the picture, in the spectacle, sometimes he's the point of view. Uh, and so on and so forth, but everything is centered uh, around around this. So clearly, uh, if uh, and that's why I would you see I think it's a it's an error to assimilate 19th century realism to that kind of representation. One can attack 19th century realism all the ways one likes, but one thing it isn't is representation in that sense. Uh, what it is much closer to, and this is again a point I tried to make in this, in this paper, what it's much closer to is not theater, but film. Filmic space is, is like the 19th century novel. Theatrical space has nothing to do with that. So we have two kinds of space. In our cœur simple, filmic space, referential space, serial space. In, uh, in Herodias, we have um, theatrical space, the space of presence, the space of the center the space of point of view. Um, and the organization in dramatic terms too, that is this is a play and we really have, a, we have the unities and so on and so forth. And I'm not saying that that isn't a very influential form and, and temptation for the late, for late 19th century novelists. That is, it's very clear that uh, in their anxiety of freedom, if you like, in their uh, anxiety about referential space, they will have a very great um, temptation to have recourse to the much more comforting closures and unities of the theater. So Henry James at once then uh, gets theatrical unities and tries to rebuild the novel around those, around point of view, and so on and so forth. But that's a compensatory reaction to what's happening to, uh, uh, to space. That's already a kind, of, uh, a kind of compensation for this flight of space and of daily life and, and so on and so forth. Okay, well, if that's the case, then what is, what, what's going on in saint Julien? It's not centered, really, but it's not without quality either. I think we have to see this as the space, uh, and I don't have the right words for this. I don't know quite how to say this, this one. The other ones we have the words for. This is the kind of indefinite space of legend. That is, it's a kind of space where you don't know how big the world is, You've heard things. You've heard that somewhere there's a city all made of gold where people eat out of gold. Where is it? Nobody knows. Some, some, some things have been brought back about this. Somewhere there's an emperor of Occitanie. Somewhere there's a, there's a, they're, they're, they're barbarous peoples who live on the edge of the world and um, eat their grandmothers and so on. But this is all. And this kind of space, you see, is neither the space where you see uh, you see the, uh, uh, um, the, the theatrical plenitude in front of you, nor is it the quantified space. We, we know where everything is in our, in our quantified space. If Felicite wants to, uh, the, 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 um, the presence in Havana of, uh, of her little nephew, that's, uh, we get a kind of, if you like, a kind of interference. Her mode of thinking is no doubt of the legendary type. But she's made to understand that um, uh, you don't think in legendary terms in the modern world. That is, we have maps. We know exactly where Havana is. Everything has its place. I mean, and, uh, and Havana isn't the center of anything either, uh, and so on and so forth. So, so there really is now a, a kind of different, uh, a, a kind of great difference between that quantified space and the, and the space of, of legend. Okay, now to these things, I think, uh, correspond... Um, and here we want to move to uh, to a um, to a, a more to, to an interpretation of these. I, I would say then, and I think this is the point I had suggested last time, without really having given it any content. I would suggest then that ultimately, what this book does, the way it shifts from one of these types of space to another, from one of these modes of representation to another. These are three modes of representation. Uh, one is the story of a story the legend. The other is, uh, is the production, what I call the production of the referent, realistic narrative. 
And the third is finally uh, the theatrical, uh, theatrical representation. These are three modes of representation. And therefore, I think we want to say that the book is really about modes of representation, whatever we may mean by that. Uh, it enforces a meditation on those things. You can't pass from one of these modes of representation to another without suddenly having to ask yourself, how is it that you can have three different things like this? You see, this is also the way Flaubert keeps his own realism alive. If you simply take a realistic narrative by itself and you throw it out in the world, what happens is that it becomes a convention. And everybody says, well, of course, uh, that's, that's the way you represent the world and, and so on. And therefore, nothing, there's, no, there's no longer any achievement of, uh, of writing to be involved. There's no invention of realism because it just becomes common sense that you tell about the world like that. So it's by shifting from that mode of representation to a different one that you can suddenly make people see that realism is something special too, that this mode of, of secular writing, uh, the writing of everyday life, the space of everyday life, is historically different. So you enforce a meditation on modes of representation, which is also a meditation on history, on the quality of modes of production, of, of, of social life. Those things are exactly, are, are rigorously identical. To, to meditate on the nature of the realistic mode of representation is to meditate also on the quality of life in the everyday world, on, uh, on space in the everyday world, on quantification, and so on and so forth. But, uh, but you have to, but you can only provoke that kind of meditation by this effect of shifting back and forth, by this, um, the effect of the triptych, by shifting gears and making it clear that uh, shifting is out of our society, if you like. Okay? This is, in a way, Flaubert's way of keeping open a possibility for us to step outside of our society and look back at it and, and, and interrogate it. Now, in another sense, uh, all of these modes of representation, in one way or another, are somehow, have a social f intent. Uh, because, even Felicité, you see, this is about the modern world, but it's the negative of the modern world. Uh, Felicité, Felicité's story is, how can I put it, is that of, is a, neg is a living negation of the bourgeoisie. She lives in a world in which the bourgeoisie, the bourgeoisie whom Flaubert detested, if you like, in a kind of self, self-loathing and so on, with whom he was obsessed, uh, uh, the bourgeoisie is constantly, is sort of present in the background of all this in as, as stupidity as, as, what is, um, uh, as what is being, um, uh, as what is being negated here. I, 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 have, a, I have an example I wanted to, this is in this, the, that Havana section I alluded to. I was going to quote you that for one reason, but I found a different reason for doing it. Uh, I'm not going to quote it all. Find the French because I think, in fact, um, this translation doesn't make it clear what's going on. You, here, here you finally Felicité looking at the map. Show me the house, you know, where, where uh, my nephew is. And Felicité, this is the English translation. And Felicité, whose intelligence was so limited that she probably expected to see an actual portrait of her nephew, could not make out why he was laughing. Monsieur Bourget is laughing. Now the French doesn't say that. Uh, if I can find it. The French says this, if Felicité n'en comprenait, euh, comprenait pas le motif, euh, he's already laughing, you see. Euh, Bourré leva le bras, il éternua énormément, une candeur pareille, c'était sa joie. If Felicité n'en comprenait pas le motif, elle, qui s'attendait peut-être à voir jusqu'au portrait de son neveu, dans son intelligence, était bornée. Well, the English text, this is a problem of the Stil and the The English text allows us to believe that these are Flaubert's words. In the French text, it's very clear that Flaubert has nothing to do with this characterization of Félicité. That this is Félicité seen by the bourgeois and described by the bourgeois. That's the language. Que son intelligence est bornée, quelle gourde. Uh, and so on. That's the language of the bourgeoisie about her. Flaubert doesn't want anything to do with that. And indeed, her, uh, it's a very, this is a motif of, of all kinds of modern literature from Wordsworth on, her stupidity, 
like Wordsworth's imbeciles, you know, her, her is an innocence. The, the empty mind that she has, her non-thinking, is more valuable than the thoughts of the bourgeoisie, than the intelligence of the bourgeoisie, and is a judgment on them by negation. So the fact that even this representation of the modern world is an attack on the bourgeoisie, because it represents uh, a kind of innocence and, and emptiness, it is their other, uh, and, it, uh, and it puts them, it is uh, a, a way of calling them into question. So um, then we look at the other Kant and we ask ourselves, in what way are these also humiliations of the bourgeoisie, its values, its experience, its way of thinking? So I think this is done through precisely through modes of representation. The, that to which Saint Julien as a mode of representation corresponds, and here I draw very heavily on Benjamin, is the older story, that is, the story uh, that's told, uh, ultimately, if you like, the fairy tale, the story which is told by peasant classes, generally. This is the world of magic. This is the magical story. Uh, the, the, the genre, if you like, is the fairy tale. And uh, as Bloch and other people have pointed out, the, 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 the fairy tale is the very, is the, the artistic expression of the peasantry. Uh, so, to endorse or to, to revive, even in pastiche, a mode of storytelling which is that of the peasantry is also to cancel out the bourgeoisie in some way. Uh, when Flaubert says in his few moments of sentimentality, I forget who his granddaughter tells the story, il s'en donne le vrai, it's, it's because he's looking at, uh, at peasants and he's saying, that's really the way one ought to live. That's the, that's the, that, that, that way of life has truth. Our way of life is empty. Well, that's using this mode of storytelling does that too. And finally, uh, the final representation, theatrical, uh, the king's body, representation of the center and so forth, this is also anti-bourgeois, but not from below, from above. This is the tale of vice, luxury, uh, 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 all of the uh, all of all of the, the the jewelry and riches and and everything. Kind of this is the aesthetic expression now of the older. Oh, I don't know. You don't even want to say aristocracies. I would say the the older modes of Oriental despotism, the older types of of uh, of uh, uh, of tyrannical splendor, uh, of, a, of 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 also of a mode, social mode, and a mode of representation which does not know the baseness of middle class life, which distinguishes itself from middle class life, cancels it out, not by its naivete and magic, not by its emptiness, but by its splendor and sybaritic uh, uh, um, uh, um, uh, decadence and, and, uh, and so forth. So, so these are some of the ways in which, um, uh, in which this, in which the, the way in which this story is a story about art, uh, what is art? Seeing the parrot as the Holy Ghost, having a vision of Christ, or annunciatory art, prophetic art. The, this, these three tales are about art and what it is, or they raise the issue of what art is. What is, what, what is artistic production? But that question, this is what I'm trying to say. I, I'm, I'm trying to show that that kind of interpretation in aesthetic terms, everybody knows that all modern art is about art, right? That's, not, uh, that's a kind of uh, unexamined uh, cliche of our, of our criticism. Of course, all modern art is reflexive. That's what modernism is. It's, it's about uh, the, 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 the pro But what I want to say is, sure, this is then going on in Flaubert. It would have to be. Flaubert is at the very origins of modern art. But that's not something which is separate from the interpretation of these things in terms of history, in terms of modes of production as a meditation on history. It is the same. The, 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 uh, the, the way in which this t these tales, this, you, this triptych, is about modes of representation is exactly the same as the way it's about modes of production. The reflection on the one is the same as the other and passes through the mediation of the other and, and vice versa. We can't understand the one without the other. So that in this sense, uh, we reach a kind of interpretation which to my mind is more concrete because precisely it's, uh, um, it, is a, um, it has to do with, um, uh, it allows us to show uh, 
to complete one interpretive code, the purely aesthetic one, the reflection on language, with, uh, with all the rest, and to show that finally those codes are not separate after all, and that they are part of one uh, ultimate thing, which has to do with, uh, which has to do with uh, um, society history in some very large, larger sense. Okay, now what about the psychoanalytic dimension? I'm not sure that I'm capable of reuniting that, but we've seen that at least, we've seen a way that at least some of it can come back in here. Uh, and that's the whole question of desire, and that's where I want to pass to the, the, the question of, religious, uh, of the religious interpretation. Because clearly there's another thing that it's about. It's about religion. It's about the beatific visions. It's about belief, uh, lack of belief, uh, all the rest of it. Felicité is an inhabitant of a secular world who, because of that, a world in, from which religion has disappeared, who, because of that, has to superstitiously invent uh, a religion. Uh, the Herodias is about a world in a, a world of a babel of codes, a kind of decadent, uh, almost Alexandrian uh, uh, chaos of all the various sects and beliefs, which is on the point of reuniting into a single great code and a single great belief. Saint John the Baptist announces Christianity. It never comes but it's always, it's in the future. Then how is one to see Saint-Julien? It seems to me that that's the attempt, that has to be the attempt, to see what the inside of the world of belief would be. What is, what is it like to believe? Now at this point I have a, uh, I, ha I say some things about religion in my Weber article. I'm gonna summarize them very briefly because uh, we don't have a lot of time. Uh, I wanna make the connection with Conrad. That's also about belief. The pilgrims, they streamed aboard over three gangways. They streamed in, urged by faith and the hope of paradise. They streamed in with a continuous trample and shuffle of bare feet without a word, a murmur, or a look. Um, like water filling a cistern, like water flowing into crevices and crannies, like water rising silently even with a rim. 800 men and women with faith and hopes, with affections and memories they'd collected there coming from north and south and from the outskirts of the east after treading the jungle paths, descending the rivers and so on and so on. Uh, this is very uh, important throughout the late 19th century and I want to say then very briefly that what religion is here, religion is the thought of the other. That is, uh, religion, there's an interesting book, sort of inconclusive, but it's got a lot of good data by Rodney Needham, the anthropologist on belief. I think it's called Language Something or Other and Belief. Anybody know what the exact title is? I'll, I'll find it for you if you're interested. In which what he tries to show is that belief, belief is a non-concept. That is, it's something that you apply to other people. Um, most of the, most of the, 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 the great culture languages don't have a word for that. Um, and he goes back into Hebrew, I think, and other things. That there really is not a, the, the, what we have translated as belief uh, meant something else and is not what we're trying to make it, uh, make it uh, mean. Now, Max Weber uh, has a marvelous uh, expression for what I, wanna, uh, what I wanna single out here. Uh, Weber, who was fascinated by religion and the, one of the great, the great sociologists of religion after all, and, and uh, uh, um, Weber uh, said that he himself was religiously unmusical. Uh, and it seems to me that this, is, that this is the best way of characterizing the attitude, not only of the 19th century, but especially of the 19th century to religion and the, the really the ultimate value. Uh, one, it's often said that there was a kind of a religious reaction after the French Revolution. Uh, obviously, when the when the emigres got back, they realized that it was much better, and also the, the British realized it was much better to to have um, the people believe than to spread these Voltairean ideas among them. And so there is a kind of religious revival as a mode of social control. But you have a writer like Chateaubriand writing. Um, the, the, the le génie du christianisme, the, 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 the genius of Christianity is not the right translation, uh, which would seem to be a revival of Catholicism. Well, it isn't that at all. 
It's not Catholicism anymore. Uh, real religion is part of a functioning social order. That's no longer possible here. This is aesthetic Christianity. This is the aesthetics of religion now. This is religion seen as, a, as an image and as a mode of, uh, of, uh, of, of um, uh, uh, as, a, um, as a mode of representing a thought uh, which is close to you, which is other, uh, other to you. This goes all the way from, uh, from, from Chateaubriand to the, the, the positivist, Renan, Renan's history of Christianity. This is all aesthetic fascination with something which is close to you. You can't believe, but you're fascinated by belief, religiously unmusical, and your mode of fascination is an aesthetic one, all the way to Malraux and the Voices of Silence, and Malraux's whole fascination with, with this. So religion becomes uh, reified. It becomes a thing of which you see the outside. It's the sign of a social order which is closed to you. It's a sign of a mode of existence which is that of others, that of the past, that you can't go back to but that you remain fascinated by as the hypostasis of some mode of complete existence, meaningful existence, uh, existence that has a content and which your, your existence doesn't anymore. I think it's in, those, it's in that sense that we must see this aesthetic fascination with religion of Flaubert, this fascination with all of these weird beliefs, uh, with beliefs that are conventional to us, medieval Christianity, but also all of the weirdest kinds of superstition, and then his own religion of art. What's that? His own monasticism and his own uh, uh, attempt to, to uh, invent a religion uh, around uh, artistic practice itself. What is all of this but this attempt to somehow um, uh, this attempt to somehow um, uh, create a, uh, uh, to, to conjure up a kind of uh, optical illusion of the plenitude of life in a, meaningful, uh, uh, in, in a meaningful way, which will then be called belief, and which is always the property of the other. Uh, now, in Conrad, the process has gone much farther, and we'll look at that uh, uh, later. Um, in Flaubert, though, I think there's another, besides, uh, besides Weber, there's someone else one should evoke for all of this, uh, and it is Nietzsche. When Nietzsche talks about a studying value, the transvaluation of values, what he means is um, there has come a moment in modern life when uh, value becomes an object of study in its own right. Uh, and obviously, at the moment when you study values, you're no longer, you no longer have a value, right? Otherwise, you couldn't study them. You wouldn't be outside of them. So you have to find a position which is beyond value in order to see what value is. And that's how, very paradoxically, Nietzsche's transvaluation of all values, which sounds like a kind of great heroic slogan of some kind, trans-apocalyptic slogan, becomes in Weber the famous, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, 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 Wertfreiheit objectivity, scientific objectivity. It's an odd sort of combination. Or rather, Weber's ideal of, of scientific objectivity is Nietzschean. And some very interesting things have shown that. It's really a heroic position. It's not, a, it's not the position of the bourgeois uh, social scientist or anything at all. Well, uh, the whole point about the moment at which value can become visible as an object is when, of course, values become problematical. Is you don't study something called value. It, it, people in a tribal society aren't, don't know anything about value because each activity has its own telos, its own quality, is, its own ritual, and so on. And each of these activities is incomparable. But you come to study the telos of activities when they have become, become uh, interchangeable. At that moment, suddenly, value separates itself out. One asks itself, what is that? How is it that people do things, believe in things. And then belief becomes an object of study, which is to say an object of aesthetic contemplation. And so there's a constant kind of fascination, nostalgia for a religion, uh, attempt to represent it, disgust with it too, uh, all kinds of things uh, 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 which, are, uh, which are central to, uh, uh, to, this, to, 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 uh, to, uh, to this, and which are the, to my mind then, the, uh, the symbolic uh, sense of, of um, of religion in this, um, in, in this narrative, and the way in which that, too, 
rejoins uh, that whole meditation on various types of religion, which would also be various types of access to full languages, full hallucinatory visions, to, to, to art, uh, to real meaning. Uh, that's the way that that, I think, ties back into this schema. And the other sort of modes of completeness, um, one could make a Grimasian, I'll try to do that next time, kind of Grimasian table of the way in which you have various images of, of um, emptiness or fullness. Felicite's emptiness, the fullness of bloodlust, um, the, uh, the uh, for, pure formality of activity, hunting, and so on. And finally, the concrete synthesis of belief. That would be the solution. That would be, uh, that would be complete plenitude plus self-consciousness, unlike bloodlust. That would be complete meaning, unlike what Felicite does. That would be activity which was not purely formal, which had a content, unlike uh, the hunt. And yet, it's impossible. It belongs only to the others or the past. And so these four, these three other forms, I think, link up in that. Okay, I've talked too much. Maybe uh, there, there may be a little bit of time for, for questions or discussion or, uh, or whatever. Yes. Well, I sort of tried to smuggle that in through, uh, through the question of desire and so on and, and uh, the business of... Uh, I, I think the other, the other place to go at this would be the position of women, and, and I don't know quite what to do with that, but it's obvious that it's very... that there's the, the misogyny of that formula that I, uh, that I gave you the other day. Uh, the, the, this, the, there's the identification with Felicite. Uh, uh, there is the whole maternal business. I, I, I don't know what to do with that, but we might think about that and see if we can find out. But it can't not uh, range itself somewhere in these regularities or irregularities in this kind of rhythm that we've been discovering. Uh, uh, seems to me that, that uh, there is surely there too, gonna, we're going to find that these stories project uh, the final malignant uh, castrating woman at the end, the maternal woman at the beginning and so on. They, they, they project uh, the, the Oedipal drama of the of the central thing. They project uh, um, specificities which ultimately have to be read back into, into what, we, what we're doing, I, I would think. Yes? Uh, your reference to Walter Benjamin's Illumination, could you, uh, uh, it's, you say you had a text of that? Uh, no, that, there's a, that's in paperback. That's pretty widely accessible, is I think. Shock and Books. Illuminations is the name of the collection, and the, the, the essay is um, well, the, 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 the key one from this point of view I've been talking about today is called The Storyteller on uh, Leskov's stories, which are peasant, sort of peasant, marvelous uh, fairy tales, not unlike this, this, uh, this one of, um, this one of, uh, of, of, of Saint-Julien. If you like, you know, um, here's, a, here's a subject for, for, for some of you. Look at, do you know Stravinsky's Histoire du Soldat, which is similar in lots of ways to this, to this legend, marvelous little uh, thing right after, written right after the, the, the Rite of Spring. Read, I'm trying to give you some material for syntheses. Read Adorno on Stravinsky, study L'Histoire du Soldat, and then come back to this legendary uh, representation in Saint-Julien and see, what, uh, see if that makes a kind of uh, see if that makes a kind of interesting unity and, and see if that ties in both from a point of view of the mode of, mode of representation of the legend and uh, in terms of what Adorno was saying about the archaic kind of return to a legend like that. Second yes. question. You mentioned Voloshinov. Is this Voloshinov, a, is yes. This was a pen French? name people think for Bakhtin who wrote uh, uh, Rabelais in his world. And the book I think is a very important book on... Uh, called Marxism and the Philosophy of Language. Is it English? Yes. Uh, Academy Press, I think. It's also important for um, point of view, for Stilandiac Libre and so on, of which you He has another book that's just been translated, written in the late 20s on uh, psychoanalysis called Freudianism, which is uh, a very, it's the, the mo very anticipatory moment of that Russian whole, Russian thing in the 20s, which disappeared. Any other? Uh... Okay. Well, look. The next time in on our fr in our Friday session, we'll try to get. We won't necessarily have to abandon Flaubert, but we'll try to get to Conrad.
the book you just mentioned, Freudian, or is it by the same? Yes, and author? also in that, but published by the same, uh, by the same uh, uh, publisher. So is that destiny, this happened to him, that happened to him, and so on. This is breaking down. Uh, and indeed, uh, I would sort of argue that um, uh, one of the things that the novel does is to demystify this older storytelling apparatus and to, uh, to implicitly corrode this whole uh, system of things which uh, is involved, which is a kind of unit of destinies and, and, uh, and names. Names are, in modern narrative, um, dissolved. Uh, the great, um, uh, it's not just modernism which is, uses the Brechtian estrangement effect or the Shklovskian uh, make it strange, making strange, because uh, Shklovsky's, all of his uh, examples of this process of how, um, how you remove the name from something and suddenly describe it without saying what it is and see it again as though for the first time and in a, in a kind of habitual, uh, uh, um, in a way that in our habitual experience we don't, uh, we don't uh, our, our perceptions are numb to it. Um, well, uh, his examples are Tolstoy. Uh, and indeed, if you look at Tolstoy in that light, you see that there's nothing but a, a kind of immense process of, uh, of uh, giving phenomena and taking their names off. Uh, you have, a, I forget what it is, a, a theater. Now, this is, of course, part of the ideology of Tolstoy. All of those things are artificial. They're part of society. They're not natural, and that's what you want to show. But you go to the theater. You don't say it's a theater, because if you said um, so-and-so went to the theater, then we're in the, the realm of, um, uh, of uh, conventional values, and we know what that is, and we heard of that before, and that's an activity which is perfectly acceptable in our society, and uh, we know where we stand, and uh, we can, so we don't even see it anymore. Instead, we have somebody walking into a place where people are sitting down, other people are standing up in front of them, walking around with funny clothes on, and so on, and suddenly, we draw back, we see this for the first time, and we also see that it's a very strange, uh, it's a very strange uh, institution or activity to, to be, for human beings to, to be engaged in. At any rate, that's one of the ways in which the novel, um, the novel tends to demystify uh, this, um, the, the, this older uh, storytelling apparatus. And some of this is coming through in Flaubert too. But in Flaubert, it's coming through in a somewhat different way by breaking up activity by um, uh, what, what in the strictest sense of the word is meant by analysis. That is, um, you, you, you assume that these activities are now uh, reducible to their component parts. They weren't before. Before they were somehow organic, they had a name. Uh, if, uh, if, you, uh, if, if you have a métier or a trade or something like that, uh, that has a kind of unity, your activity has a kind of unity of its own, a kind of qualitative unity. There's a word for that. You don't stop in the middle of it. These gestures are complete and they fold into each other and so on. When you pass from that to modern rationalization, as we'll see later on, next time, um, you break that up. Uh, you don't assume anymore that activity has, uh, has, a, has a unity of its own. Rather, you want to reduce it to the smallest, to its smallest parts, which are now no longer meaningful because they're all bits and pieces, and you put it together in a new and rational way. Well, that's in many ways what Flaubert does when he uh, when he tells um, uh, when he uh, when he tries to put into words uh, older kinds of conventional uh, unities of all kinds. Uh, he takes these things, and I give a few examples in this paper. He takes these things and suddenly breaks them up in a different way and then puts them back together in such a way that uh, we still see what they are, but what we admire is less the thing itself. We've come to realize that its unity is problematical than the virtuoso bravura of the artist who is putting, putting these, new, these, these sentences together in this way. So suddenly uh, there's a kind of shift from uh, the unity of event, the unity, the meaning, the meaning of the event itself, 
to the productive process of the artist and the way that he supremely uh, plays with these things, breaks them into pieces, reconstructs them in another way, in an, in an unusual way, and makes style out of them and makes art out of them. Well, that's, uh, those, that's one of the things that I was talking about in this essay, and, and that, that has much relevance not only then to Flaubert, but of course to Conrad when you start to think about how uh, what it means to tell a story over and over again from different points of view and so on. Uh, there is then a, a, a something, uh, a, something analogous uh, going on. Uh, but my main point in this essay was that realistic sort of referential narrative, as I call it, uh, people don't like that word, but uh, that's the only one I could think of. Um, referential narrative uh, is, has a different kind of space than, than that of... Um, than that of old-fashioned storytelling. Seems to me old-fashioned storytelling is not really sensory. That is, it doesn't want us to, um, to be mesmerized by um, the sheer physical quotient of sensations and so on uh, that's, uh, that, uh, that a realistic novelist, uh, w beginning with Flaubert, wants to convey. Rather, um, uh, storytelling of the older type is sort of flat or, or uh, what would you call it, two-dimensional, I guess. Um, and uh, that doesn't mean that it's not mimetic or that it's not representational, but its space is, is different. Now, what I want to suggest is that in Flaubert, and here Flaubert is sort of symptom, emblematic, symptomatic of, of this whole new development, in Flaubert, a new kind of space begins to be produced by the writing. And this is the same as the space of daily life which is being produced in secular society, in, in market society. It's this space that I called serial space. And I try to show, and I don't want to prolong this, but I try to show in this paper that, that you may want to look at how the very sentences are designed not to coincide anymore with the object that they describe, but to leave a kind of gap between themselves and their referent. That is to say, to produce referentiality, to, to make you think what does this, can, to make you imagine a referent, if you like, to make you uh, invent yourself as a reader this referential space which is now behind these sentences. And I think this is then part and parcel of the whole, of our, the aesthetics of, of, of the stuff we read, of the bestseller, and of, and of what's become our literary conventions. And I think it's very different from the older, uh, the older kind of storytelling. Now, when I gave this talk, uh, Cy Hamlin, he asked me a very embarrassing question, which was, um, this is all right as, a, as an analysis of the micro level of Flaubert, that is, of what's going on at the level of the sentences. How do you get out of that level? Can one pass from that micro level to the macro level of what happens in Flaubert, of what the plots are about, of what the... Well, uh, I agreed that uh, one really ought to be able to do that. Um, I felt also that I wanted to be careful not to do it too mechanically, uh, and, uh, and I really didn't have a good answer at that time. But now I have a much better answer, which is that what I'm describing on the level of sentences is very precisely what I described, what I tried to convey uh, here uh, the last time uh, about the production of history as an absent cause. As it seems to me that this perspectival sense of history as the ultimate referent, which you'll never see and which you never get to, is very much uh, on, a, on the larger level of plot and everything else, is very much in the spirit of what the individual sentences are producing in the realm of uh, sort of um, experiential space and, and uh, the immediate experience of an object world and of, uh, and of, and of people in it and of moving around and, and, and of, uh, and of uh, sort of micro, micro events. Um, so I would want to I would want to argue that, but I have some some kinds of qualifications to add to that view of things, and I'll, I'll they'll come up uh, later. On. Now, uh, so that's one that's one text that's over there that I think will complete some of the things that I've been saying. There are two other texts I recommend to you. Uh, one is uh, on um, Max Weber, uh, who's sort of behind this in lots of ways that will again become more visible next time. It's a paper I. I call, um, uh, what do I call it again? 
uh, The Vanishing Mediator, Narrative Structure and Max Weber. Uh, it's in, I'll put this over there, this is an issue of the Birmingham Cultural Studies. It's in this, it's also in my uh, manuscript that, I, that I've left. Uh, and finally, there's a long essay on Barthes, S.Z., and on Jonathan Culler's book on Flaubert called The Ideology of the Text, which has some relevance to this and discusses uh, the, the Barthes effet de réel, reality effect, and things like that. So those are some, some kinds of completions of, of themes that I, that I may raise here. Now, two, um, there are two ongoing problems that have come out of this, uh, as I see it, they're really the same. Uh, that have come out of the last uh, discussions. One from a few weeks ago, this is my way of, I don't know whether this, in this form, this problem will mean anything to you as such, but sort of for my own benefit, I restate it. It's this, so we said that uh, the medieval scheme of interpreting really required there to be a literal level. That is, uh, in, uh, in the medieval view of things, uh, in a sense, the only texts that you can interpret are the texts which are true, that is literal. That is to say, the history of the people of Israel, the Bible, taken as a transcript of God's book of the truth. Well, that then raises the very basic problem of aesthetics itself. Uh, that's all very well and good for the Bible or for people who believe that, uh, that, that the Old Testament uh, is really God's book and so on, or that the events of the Old Testament are... are uh, but what do we do then with fictive texts? Uh, does that mean that fictive texts cannot really be interpreted in, this, in these multiple senses because we're, we're, we don't have a, uh, or is there some level of literality to a literary text? If we want to invent a new interpretive scheme which would be adequate for us as this older four levels of, of writing was for, for medieval or classical times, uh, what kind of literal level do we, do we have to endow the literary work with or the artistic text? Now, pretty clearly, that literal level isn't going to be that of documents. In other words, uh, um, if our friends in 19th century French history came to us and, and we said that you ought to really read, uh, uh, you ought to read uh, Trois Contes is very useful for 19th century history, uh, it would, we would probably not endorse the use that they would make of it, that is to say, um, a sample as a document about uh, provincial life, uh, uh, or even worse yet, uh, um, Herodias 10 said he learned more about, uh, uh, about the, the society of, uh, of the, around the time of Christ from reading Herodias than in all the volumes of Renan who had written the life of Jesus, you know, in the whole. Well, I think that's not the kind of literal uh, meaning that we're, that we're talking about. Uh, so what is it? I mean, that, that's my, uh, that's, that would be one way of uh, posing this problem. There is another way of posing it, which I think may mean something more to you, because um, it was raised the other day, uh, yesterday. And that's this. We talked about how in Foucault um, a certain kind of figural apparatus, uh, here's this panopticon which really doesn't exist anywhere, you know. I mean, uh, it's a kind of idea of a non-existent thing, with an idea of a non-existent building, which is then, uh, which Foucault then uses in a kind of pedagogical way uh, uh, as a something that you use your pointer and point out things on as a way of organizing discourse and so on. Um, Foucault is using this to crystallize absent history. Now, it looks as though we're saying that Flaubert is doing much the same thing. But does that mean uh, that the literary text of Flaubert has the same status as the figures or objects or material uh, interpretants or whatever of Foucault's text? Clearly, uh, it doesn't. And so one of the things that I think we ought to be thinking about would be the status of such texts, uh, liter of literary texts, of fictive texts and the way in which they're different from the kinds of figural operations that go on in a, uh, in a, work, uh, uh, in a work like Foucault. That's not a question that I'm prepared to, 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 to answer right now, but I think it, sh it may very legitimately serve as a kind of, um, uh, as a horizon for our, for our, uh, for our thoughts about, uh, about all this, because this book is, is certainly just as much as Foucault a meditation on history. And uh, one of the things, uh, just as 
Foucault's book is a machine for uh, making visible history in some ways, uh, uh, something which otherwise would remain unfigured, uh, unthinkable, unconceptualizable, and so on. So also uh, Three Tales is something uh, of a machine of that kind. Machine maybe for making you dream about history or something, but uh, and I, again, I don't mean in the literal sense. That is, we're not, I think uh, we, the very structure of the triptych prevents us from, say, suddenly beginning to dream about, uh, you know, um, picture postcard views of the Holy Land, the dromedaries, the people in Bernouces, you know, that, that kind of dreaming which a text could legitimately give rise to or illegitimately give rise to. Uh, that's only one, the very structure of the triptych shuts that off or, or rather makes that kind of dreaming, that kind of reverie of pop history, uh, pop culture, uh, the culture in the anthropological sense, that makes that enter into something more complicated by juxtaposing it with some other images of history and suddenly uh, making the whole process more, more complicated. So, so clearly, this is also a machine for um, making us feel something about history, making something about history become tangible to us, but just as clearly it does it in a different way, and we don't know what that way is right now, but we would like to find it out. And I think ultimately, if we find it out, we'll have an answer to this problem about the way in which we could imagine, in the medieval sense, a literal level of writing for a fictive text. The way in which uh, we could find a, a level of text which would be susceptible to interpretation in, in, this, in, in that older sense. Okay, well, um, we might then now go back to the, uh, to the text of Flaubert and look at some of the ways, I think we've, uh, we've probably said enough about it by now to, to, to show how this funny machine works, how, what a triptych uh, is, and you understand, uh, I don't want to seem uh, unnecessarily um, uh, uh, coy about, about the, this, uh, this whole process, but you understand that the point about the triptych is that uh, you have to interpret it, but you can't interpret it. So uh, you mustn't imagine that uh, at the end of this, I'm going to produce uh, a complete theory of what this text is, uh, because I think there, there can't be any such theory. The very structure of the thing uh, makes that impossible. Uh, and uh, really, uh, it unravels itself, and, and, or rather, what it does is it, it offers you uh, a set of interpretive clues whose ultimate, uh, whose ultimate result is uh, not to end up in a, in a kind of solid critical theory of the kind we like to make up and admire and so on, but rather just to send you back to the text, which then in, by the press of reading, generates another one, and so on. So, uh, so uh, there's not necessarily, um, nothing definite uh, will necessarily come of this, and indeed, after all, Flaubert is the one who said, uh, stupidity lies in wishing to conclude, uh, a vouloir conclure, uh, to draw the, draw the bottom line and to decide, to have a, uh, and stupidity consists, to sort of expand this a little more in the Flaubert worldview, uh, in having set ideas and opinions. The people in Flaubert who have opinions are always the bourgeois and the people that you, that you uh, who, you have a horror of them, but of course they're also sort of fascinating because it would be nice to have, as we'll see in a minute, it would be nice to have opinions. It would be nice to have solid thoughts about things and know exactly where you stood and to have concluded and to have drawn a bottom line. But, uh, but for Flaubert, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's a kind of uh, dizzying uh, but also slightly sickening uh, uh, thing, and, and it doesn't happen. And, and indeed, Trois-Contes, uh, in its way, won't let you conclude in that sense. But what does it do? Now, I think at this point, then, we can begin to play around with this little machine or this toy, which is the triptych, and see a number of possible, um, possible uh, um, meanings, or we, we can at least put it through its paces in, in various ways and, and see what comes of it. And indeed, uh, uh, these are just a few of the things that I've thought of, and, and uh, hopefully uh, you've, you've thought of a good many more. And, and uh, uh, 
uh, and it, I think it is desirable to, to put as many of these possibilities together um, as we can. I gave you one, a kind of psychoanalytic one, uh, the other day, just as a kind of very, um, very crude um, uh, illustration. Uh, I think it wasn't wrong, uh, in, but maybe it was wrong in that form. Um, or at least it's unusable in that form, because after all, a psychobiography of Flaubert is, uh, uh, is not where the way we want to use this text and not exactly where we want to end up with it. Uh, but I think you'll see that, though, that, that rhythm, uh, which is to say um, grief, guilt, aggressivity, uh, that's not a bad uh, example of uh, one of the ways to use this, uh, this mechanism of the triptych, this turning mechanism that, that suddenly generates these, these possibilities. Let me give you some others. I'm not sure quite in what, um, in what order to do this, but uh, how about, we, we said you know, that these works were about history. They're also about art, of course, and ultimately those things are the same, uh, as maybe we'll finally... Um, We'll finally uh, come to see. But uh, let me begin closer to, um, let me begin closer to um, the historical end and work my way towards the artistic end of the, of the, of the spectrum here. Um, we could have just as easily said, well, because this is the interpretive question, what's it about, you see? Uh, this film is about which is always, I think we said the other time, it's, that always has to be a slightly a demystification. As you think it's a love story, no, no, this film is really about money or it's really about. So that's the, that's the basic interpretive question. What is, then what is the triptych about? Well, uh, this is really about, the Trois Contes is really about solitude. On the level of the characters, this is about three solitaries. Well, first of all, how? Uh, the first solitude is a solitude of renunciation, I guess it would be, if it were enacted. This were in the late 19th century already. Uh, this becomes a dominant theme of late 19th century, uh, of the late 19th century novel. Henry James is sort of the, the most obvious, but if you know German, Fontana is another celebrant of renunciation and, and uh, uh, this whole gesture of, of abandoning the claims on life or, or the claims of desire and so on um, uh, is, uh, is, I think, everywhere in, um, in late 19th century uh, literature. Uh, in Flaubert, uh, it's renunciation projected onto another of yourself. That is, Félicité is clearly not the bourgeois novelist. She's not us. Uh, she's not the, the bourgeois reader. Uh, she's our other, our, our, not our negative, but our, uh, our empty other. Uh, she, she, what she doesn't have is what we have. So what in us would have to be a gesture, an act of renunciation, give it up, is in her un, unselfconscious and not an act. That's just her mode of existence, renunciation. She renounces because she never knew that you could do anything else. Okay, uh, so, but in Félicité, we have renunciation. Now, in, in Saint-Julien, we have renunciation, but suddenly the process has uh, changed. This renunciation is called expiation. Now it's because of guilt, a great crime. Now it's motivated. In Félicité, it wasn't motivated. But Saint-Julien must renounce. That's the only way he can come to terms with, um, with guilt. Finally, in uh, Yaokanon, in St. John the Baptist, uh, renunciation is enforced. It's because others imprison you. It's because you're in the dungeon. Uh, and this is now no, no longer a matter of, um, uh, no longer a matter of non-motivations with Felicité, nor is it a matter between you and your own acts, it's between you and other people. So suddenly, uh, in an odd kind of way, the drama of the solitary and the relationship of the solitary to his or her own desire has reached the point where it touches society. Uh, but it touches society by being separated from it in an odd way, and, uh, 
somehow we find Foucault here, oddly, uh, unexpectedly, uh, by a process of exclusion and, uh, um, uh, and uh, a, a process uh, which, uh, of action which is an action which isn't an action that is here by dying, uh, Yaokanan uh, has becomes a, a, a world historical figure, as Lukács would say, and or Hegel, and, and but this is by remaining isolated from society, by remaining ultimately separated from from uh, from people. Well, uh, this would be then w an, a, another way of uh, of putting this machine through its paces. This is about solitude. All right, let's take that further. Then, why should solitude be a basic um, be a basic theme here? Because, well, let me put it this way. Let me start uh, in another place. Uh, do you know? Uh, I think all of you are familiar with the the paintings of Magritte. Some of these paintings of, of Magritte as a kind of late uh, uh, surrealism is already kind of conceptual art or something. There's a painting of Magritte, I can't remember what it's called, where you see a kind of drab city, cityscape, um, and it's raining. Uh, but, what, but what is raining are a host of little men in uh, bowler hats with, with umbrellas, and they're all they're coming down. It's therefore a version, uh, I'm not sure if the French have an expression, this is a version of raining cats and dogs. This is raining the, the bourgeois, the city bourgeois who's coming down with this. And there are hosts of these, um, of these figures coming down. And obviously there are a lot of different, um, there are a lot of different uh, kinds of things which this painting is playing on. That is the idea of a rain uh, and of you who are holding your umbrella up to, to shelter yourself from the rain, being the rain. I mean, there's a whole play of subject and object of that kind. But what I want to insist on uh, is that it seems to me this is um, uh, a playful and aesthetic critique or representation, if you like, of the crisis of, uh, of the context itself. That is to say, this kind of art and what it does to us and why it's so fascinating for us is only possible at a moment when suddenly objects, when things fall apart, but not in Yeats' sense because that's still a, that's still a directed falling apart. That is, uh, it's a kind of centripetal, uh, centripetal apocalypse uh, which is still directed in some way, which, has a, you know, which is going someplace. No, these things are all falling apart uh, in a non, in a kind of serial way, uh, and now suddenly it becomes possible to take one object all by itself, or to take another object, or a person, or a, but how can that be? That is, uh, what are the preconditions, what mode of life, what kind of social life, what kind of world fabric uh, allows for the first time in human history this disengagement of things from their, from the web of uh, of the context in which they're seized. Um, okay, I want to. I think, and I think, um, what therefore later on will permit this very dramatic realization of, uh, and Magritte does this in other places. You know the the uh, the, the marvelous painting called um, personal values. Have, have I talked about this? I don't think so. Personal values, it's a, it shows a, um, it shows a, a bedroom. But the walls of this bedroom are the sky, blue sky and clouds. And in this bedroom, you have a little bed there, a little armoire, and a huge uh, shaving brush, and a huge cake of soap that fill up the room, and some other objects. These are your private effects, uh, things of which, uh, as Sartre says somewhere, uh, these are sort of the, the, the things that are closest to you. He says, you people, um, uh, people don't realize that they have their own lives the way you have your, to your own toothbrush. You know, you have your private life, that's like your toothbrush or your, your shaving brush or, or, or whatever. Well, these are, these are uh, this is also then the crisis of uh, the representation of objects uh, as though they were, as though, they, as though their relations to their context could be adjusted, changed, played with. Uh, and these objects are indeed parts of you, parts of your private life. But meanwhile, uh, this is a new step in this uh, critique of totality, if you like. 
because uh, it's as though Magritte went a step further from the, uh, from the, uh, the reigning picture, and he said, well, after all, if you do want to imagine a total context, can you imagine that? That is, you can't, you, you can imagine, things are separate from their context. There's no connections anymore. Or they, they, there is no organic links. What would a total context be? Well, imagine the world. Imagine a little globe spinning. Uh, imagine totality. Well, all you can imagine is blue sky. So the presence of this blue sky as a background is a critique of our impossibility of imagining everything, the everything uh, of which these individual objects would be a part. Uh, okay, well this whole, uh, this very late and kind of dramatic um, uh, symptom of the, the, the breakdown of the relationship of things, I think gives us a clue already to solitude in Flaubert, that is how can an individual person be, ha what is solitude? How can an individual human being be isolated from his or her context? How is it possible for, uh, in, in the terms we used a few weeks ago, for there to be a life which is separate, uh, which has some kind of isolated meaning of its own? Uh, nobody, this is a kind of illusion, if you like, uh, if you want to pursue the critique of humanism and the human science, this is an illusion of bourgeois individualism, that individual lives have a... Have a, have a meaning in themselves. Uh, older societies never thought anything like that, and they always realized that there was a whole fabric of lives that, that everyone's life is a part of, and, that, uh, and in terms of which alone an individual life gets its content and, and its meaning. But suddenly in our society, at least we get the illusion of thinking that people really are separate and that they are come loose from each other and that they can be isolated and that you can take... Um, uh, and that you can take a character and study a character absolutely in isolation, or that a character could live absolutely in isolation, and it seems to me that it is this which the dramatic interrogation of solitude and the solitary, this is the ultimate uh, social but also existential and also aesthetic uh, and all the rest of it, this is the ultimate meaning of this representation of three solitaries, three hermits, Three, because Flaubert is full of the whole medieval kind of vocabulary of the Saint Julien, but also Saint Anthony and so on. The three, um, what do you call them, anachorites or monks or whatever. The, these three forms of monastic isolation, of course, or vice versa. That's why he's fascinated with monastic life with the Desert Fathers and so on, because uh, because this somehow seems to be an earlier version of. Uh, the separation of an individual life. Now, once again, uh, if you want to be, if you want to be psychoanalytic about it, you would say, well, of course, Flaubert was a solitary. Uh, he deliberately withdrew. Uh, uh, he lived in. Uh, he go to Paris for uh, a month every two years, and uh, and his whole life is a practice of this kind of monastic um, isolation and, and all the rest of it. Yet, um, in a way, that also has a social meaning. Ultimately, that is, this is the. The, the, the dramatization of the way that the artist who no longer has a function is split off from, from social life and, and, and isolated and has to uh, uh, produce uh, private languages, a product out of his own private language, which is then uh, sent away at distance from him and, and to, to seek its fate in the, in the market and, uh, uh, and, and so forth. So that there, too, I think we ultimately rejoin this, um, this kind of... Um, this level of the problem, which is uh, that of um, that of isolation. Okay, that's one way of talking about it. Now, uh, there are other ways we could look at that. Uh, how about destiny? We can say, uh, all right, because we said, you know, that um, old-fashioned storytelling depended very much on destiny, and I think in that light we will want to come to see that Saint-Julien is precisely a pastiche of an old-fashioned story of that type, uh, and we'll want to find out what that might be later on. But uh, so this is probably going to, and after all, every every novel, every tale, especially, but every narrative, must uh, above and beyond whatever else it's doing, whatever its immediate content, it must somehow implicitly or explicitly raise the question of what the event is. What is an event? What is an experience? 
what is the form uh, which is taken by human experience or by the subject-object relationship or by people's life and time, by temporality, whatever form you want to give this, but all narrative implicitly uh, either by suggesting that it has the answer to this problem uh, or by uh, really uh, uh, demonstrating that uh, it is impossible to solve this problem raises the question of the nature of the event. Uh, but uh, in, in older storytelling, uh, that was called destiny, and it wasn't a problem. Uh, now, how, how, would this, how would this work out here? Well, clearly, um, Felicité's life, what would we call that? It's an anti-destiny. It has no, uh, she isn't, uh, nothing happens to her. You know that marvelous, uh, Camus used this in his play of Caligula, but it's also in, it's in the lives of the Caesars. One of Caligula's... Um, among Caligula's many sort of insanities uh, was this anecdote when uh, uh, someone at a, at a theater booed uh, an actor that Caligula was fond of, and the emperor had him arrested at once, and the man was in fear of his life, and Caligula put him on a boat for Egypt with a message to the governor general of, of Egypt. Well, the person assumed naturally that when he arrived in Egypt, now why was he being sent there? Well, no one knows, but when he arrived in Egypt, of course, he would be executed. When the governor general opened up the note, it said, do not do anything, either good or bad, to the bearer of this note. Uh, well, that's sort of a little bit like what happens to Felicite, neither good nor bad, nothing happens to her, in short. She has no destiny, she knows no, uh, no events, but of course, there are still events, uh, and there are, um, and they're, they're produced uh, in a way by, uh, by compensation or by dialectical process. So we have these few memorable things like the, the flight from the bull, uh, which is, becomes a kind of legendary thing. Uh, and that kind of uh, heroic moment becomes then the very form of the, uh, of the anecdote, if you like. It's the moment when Felicite as a peasant is able to save the city people. Uh, and there's a lot of content to that. You can also make your psychoanalytic uh, interpretation, if you like, this, all these women menaced by the, the, the very symbol of, of masculinity, which is absolutely absent from this, from, this whole, from this whole story, and indeed from most of these, uh, from all of these, these tales and so forth. But, uh, but on the level that we're talking about it, on the level of events, this is the kind of dialectical counterpart to a life in which nothing happens. Now, uh, Saint-Julien, on the other hand, has a great destiny. To him, everything will happen. Uh, but of course, at that level of, uh, of memorableness, as Benjamin would say, we, we reach this whole archaic or, you know, Freud's essay on the antithetical meaning of primal words, which rejoins the the, 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 primitive, uh, the, the primitive ambivalence of the sacred, we rejoin something which is so powerful uh, that it's both positive and negative. Uh, Freud said, showed that in uh, sort of primal words, good, bad, things like that, uh, all in, in their origins, in archaic languages, these words meant both positive and, um, and, uh, and negative things at once. So in, uh, in the, the world of magic, the, the sacred object uh, has, radiates, it has positive power, it cures and so forth, but it will also kill you if you touch it. It's both a sacred and, and also unclean. Uh, and all of these things are joined in a kind of primal ambivalent. Well, this is clearly what happens to the destiny of Saint-Julien. When you're chosen for a destiny that's this remarkable, for the ultimate destiny, it's both good and bad. You're both the greatest sinner and the greatest saint. Or rather, this, uh, the, the Saint-Julien commits the most horrible uh, of all crimes. And that's, he commits, that's a kind of formally empty thing. That is, it could be anything, but uh, we want to, it's a kind of, merely a kind of demonstration. So we ritually make him kill his mother and his father, and that will stand as the most terrible of all crimes. And then, uh, he also knows the most glorious of all the destinies of salvation uh, uh, and uh, sainthood and, and, uh, and all the rest. Uh, finally then, we have a kind of 
in the story of Yaakonon, we have a kind of dialectical synthesis of these two things. Uh, this is a non-life also. This is a life which is uh, destroyed, uh, which is uh, put an end to, so Felicites is a living death and this is a real death. Uh, it's imprisonment and thus is empty the way Felicites is. Uh, it is therefore a non-destiny, but uh, a non-destiny which will announce a great destiny, that is, which is enunciatory. Saint-Julien uh, was uh, achieved a great destiny. Uh, Saint John the Baptist will, however, be the synthesis of pointing to a great destiny, pointing to something great, pointing to a plenitude, but remaining in the area of the, uh, the non-destiny. Okay, that's, um, and uh, I think you should be aware, I guess, because uh, really this is, it comes out of, uh, comes out of uh, Hegel. Really, the, this whole business of displacement that we've been talking about of mediations where you have to move uh, from, from the immediate to what's behind it and so on and so on. Well, this is religious vocabulary after all. That is, Hegel's notion of mediation does ultimately come from a theological meditation and this is the, these are the, the mediator, of course, Christ and so on. These are the classical theological terms and it, this, is a, this in its origins is theological thought. And so, uh, you know, that St. John the Baptist would be the mediator for the Christ, would announce Christ and so forth, and that that would take place in a work whose very fabric is mediatory. Uh, there's a consonance and a harmony in, in, uh, in all of that. Okay, now what about uh, the levels of, uh, okay, look, let's look at other things, activity. We talked about destiny, but what about activity? Felicite, I'll go a little faster now. Felicite um, uh, uh, shows clearly, I would say, empty routine. The activities which go on in this secular world are those of the household, uh, and they're, uh, they're empty, they're doubly empty because they, are, they take place presumably in a world where men uh, are doing something real that is outside of the, the home. But who are the men? Monsieur Bourret, probably, and we find that what he's doing is not what he seemed to be doing and, uh, and so forth, so even that kind of dissolves. But, uh, but at any rate, uh, all of this is kind of doubly emptied out and, uh, and housework becomes kind of absolutely uh, empty and meaningless. And uh, so, so we have this representation of, of a kind of zero degree of, of activity. And to this would correspond, I think, um, if it were not Félicité, but we ourselves, or Flaubert himself, who experienced this, would correspond a certain feeling tone. And this feeling tone, uh, classically, from this period on, is called ennui. Boredom in the sense of the emptiness and the, 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 the hollowness of all, uh, of all activity. Now, in Saint-Julien, we get a very different picture of activity. I want to call it the hypostasis of activity. That is, in Saint-Julien, um, we have, it's as though uh, we took the empty form uh, of what activity should be. Uh, the empty form of what uh, doing things should be for human beings. And we made of it a kind of representation in its own right. Well, what, would the, what is activity? You do something in order to get something or you, uh, you begin something in order to end it or you, what, what does it mean to, to do things? Well, this empty, hypostasized form of activity is here and this will be the great, uh, the great representation of activity from really in, in, in the modern world up until industrialization will be hunting. Uh, the, uh, uh, and that's what it is already in Pascal. And Pascal wants to tell us how vain all human activities are. He says, hunting, why, what, what do you, what is the excitement in this uh, kind of empty activity whose end result is absolutely meaningless, a dead animal or something that you don't even want to eat? Uh, so hunting will come to figure this 
Of course, for us now, that's dissolved and we don't do that anymore, but I would say we, this kind of, one can get a sense of this kind of hypostasis of activity in general and also the function it can have socially if you think of sport because it would seem that sport uh, is, uh, in our society, something like this, although we have many other equivalents, and, and that's something that we want to come back to later on, too. But you see, those are things that you can't make narratives about. You can have, sure, they're, they're novels about sports, or they're, they're TV shows or movies about sports, but they're always, they always only take sports as, a, as, a, as an illustration, you know, uh, of something else. To tell the story of the pure kind of um, uh, success or failure involved in hunting or sports involved in this very abstract activity, which is kind of formal mapping out of uh, uh, trying to su succeed at something and then succeeding or failing, something that I'm going to call, following Wilden's uh, terminology in his essay on analog and digital, uh, kind of off-on structure, that is, um, it's either, all, it's either yes or no, it's a kind of off-on system where uh, the whole point of it is to succeed, uh, is whether you succeed or fail. Uh, it, it is therefore not qualitative anymore, than, or, but, but rather quantitative. Uh, uh, the point about that is that you, that is not a story that you can tell. At any rate, that seems to be what's going on uh, here, and it's related to a number of other things. That is, killing the beasts is also understood uh, it's kind of, uh, as a kind of taxonomy. Uh, Julien dreamed he was Adam among the beasts, but Adam named the beasts. Killing them is like naming them. And if you like, uh, tie in uh, Mallarmé on, on the way that uh, poetic language is a, is a, is a way of uh, preserving the world by killing it, if you like, or by distancing the, the, the real world, by substituting a word. You substitute a word in Lacan, that becomes castration, or in Barth, that becomes, that's, it is called uh, a kind of um, murder which language performs on existential experience by substituting another term, and so on and so forth. It seems to me that that, uh, that kind of, uh, that, that, that connection that Flaubert makes there is, uh, is uh, very much a part of many uh, contemporary aesthetics. But uh, so uh, hunting to hunting would correspond a kind of um, empty excitement, I guess, the kind of excitement of uh, success or failure, uh, uh, the, the, the kind of excitement uh, which is characteristic of certain, of, uh, of pure activity, uh, and which is maybe the only way we can understand this. And you see, this then also is something uh, relatively new. Um, if you're making, um, if you're making, well, first of all, the kind of hunting that's done in a, in a, in a, in a society, in a tribal society that has to hunt to eat, uh, is not sport of this kind and doesn't get represented in the same way, but rather it's a sacred activity. Uh, it's under the sign of this or that image and so on and so forth. It is a qualitative thing. It's not an off one thing. It's not a success failure thing. Uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a ritual activity. Uh, and that's a very different kind of, uh, kind of way of looking at it. And so this also then reflects a crisis of activity in the modern world. It also reflects the fact that um, all of these activities, the, the activities that remain for us to do, have been emptied of their content. They have no quality anymore. They have no kind of inner, uh, um, uh, they, they have no ritualistic sense. They don't have a an organic place in a, in a kind of uh, hierarchical order of any kind any longer. They are merely all equivalent to each other. And so if they're all equivalent, then why do them? You know? uh, if it's the same uh, to do, if, if success or failure is the criterion, and, and all, in all of these things that's the law and that's the rhythm of activity, then what's your, uh, then, then really, the passion that one brings to them becomes a kind of vice that is in the, in the classic sense of the word vice uh, where um, vice is uh, trying to excite yourself by doing something, not really being excited by something. Well, then that becomes the, the whole point of, of, uh, of these various passions, the passion for sport, the passion for gambling, which is a kind of even more uh, abstract version of all this. Uh, you would really like to be possessed by excitement uh, at this experience because that would prove that life had a meaning. But of course, somewhere in the back of your mind, you know that it's not satisfying and it's not a, 
and you're not really excited by it, and so it's, it becomes what, a, what Sartre would call a kind of life passion or a, or, or a passionate vice or an existential vice or something of that kind. Uh, so this is uh, uh, so this is uh, uh, um, uh, something of what's going on in in um, uh, in, uh, in session. Yeah, but something happens to this empty form, uh, and I think what happens to it we can see more clearly when we pass to the third of these stories, which it seems to me is dominated by a different solution to this whole uh, thing, uh, to this whole problem of activity. Uh, and one would want to call it, well, the French have a word, luxure. I think that's the best word. We say lust, but it, I think, maybe doesn't convey the whole wealth of possibilities of this, uh, of this uh, thing, which is um, uh, therefore a kind of um, obsession, uh, a sensual obsession uh, to the point of frenzy with something. Uh, and uh, naturally, in our specialized world, again, we tend to think of this always in sexual terms, but Flaubert, is, uh, Flaubert does too, but, uh, but, it, but there is a greater variety here, and we have this marvelous representation of, of uh, gluttony and the whole hideous kind of uh, eating, uh, uh, the, 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 the eating lust. Uh, and then when we look back at Saint-Julien, yeah, we have the blood lust, and for Flaubert, uh, in Flaubert's private language and in his stylized representation of things, one of the, uh, and after all, you know, because uh, although he's a reader of Saad uh, uh, and he thinks about these things, uh, there are conventions and one can only say Madame Bovary, after all, was tried by the censor and, and uh, so one has to have some, there are some, some taboos. Uh, so for the most part, uh, the great example of luxure and lust and Flaubert will not be sexual but will be the bloodlust. So what we see that what happened in Saint-Julien yeah, was a contamination of this empty form of hunting, uh, of this kind of rep repetitive uh, thing, which is hunting, gambling, anything like that that you go and do, and then you do it again. A uh, kind of attempt to give that some content, and it's, it's passage over into bloodlust, uh, and into therefore kind of mindless uh, possession by the body of, uh, of, of activity. Uh, you see, this would be a kind of dialectical opposite of Felicité. Felicité does things with no thought. She functioned like an automaton. There's a, two uses of the word functioning in this. Uh, I don't know how new that word is. I've always meant to look it up it, at this period in, in French. It can't, be, uh, it can't be a very, very old word. And it, it's a word that sort of stands out very oddly in this, in this story, this, this verb function, fonctionner. Uh, twice in this narrative to describe Felicité's uh, automatic kinds of gestures. This is a relationship to activity in the body which is mindless. Uh, that's a bad mindlessness in a way because it's empty and it's, it, for us it would be ennui. But maybe there would be a good mindlessness, that would be that of lust, in which you're so possessed that your mind goes also, but you don't have to think about the meaninglessness of life at least for a for a while because uh, during that, the period of the bloodlust, um, you are, uh, the mind is distracted as one may say and, and, uh, and thus uh, some kind of plenitude comes into being even where, where, it, uh, where it shouldn't. Uh, so, uh, so in a way these things are, all of these three forms of activity are dialectically uh, related and we might want to see, uh, we might want to see this work as then uh, a reflection on that kind of the triptych, this um, older nation of the triptych, as a reflection on that level of, um, of, uh, of things and of activity. And note, you see, um, someone mentioned the Iliad the other day, uh, note that when uh, Flaubert comes to the second mode of activity, when he comes to, to pick hunting, uh, it is important that this remain a solitary activity. That is, it is the hunt, it is not hand-to-hand -hand combat. It isn't the form which was the, the great form of uh, the, the, the form that really had a content of, of human relations in feudal society or in antique society when uh, uh, that's a kind of off on system too. I mean, either you, you win or lose. You, you, you drive your spear through the sort of those horrible Homeric descriptions or else vice versa. But nonetheless, that's a, that's a relation with another. 
that's the Hegelian struggle uh, between consciousness, Flaubert wants to be very careful that that not intervene in this representation of things. These people must, we must test all this out on the level of absolute um, uh, market indifference, on, on the level of absolute uh, solitude, of, uh, on the level of the monad, in other words. This is about three monads, and it has to stay that way. If we allowed for a Hegelian, a Sartrean, a, a Homeric confrontation between consciousnesses or a medieval, suddenly all kinds of things would open up which, which are undesirable here. So we know that later on saint uh having been a hunter, will then become a warrior, kill lots of people, take lots of cities, uh, have lots of sieges, and so on and so, so forth. But uh, we've already been programmed to the emptiness of the form of the hunt, and thus that later thing will be drained of the content that it certainly had in medieval times, and which makes this very unmedieval as a time. Okay, let's move on to something else. How about desire then? That would be another way of saying some of the things we just said. Uh, Felicité has no desire. That's the oddest thing about her. Uh, now, uh, Saint Julien knows the bloodlust. Uh, and in uh, the story of Yaokanan, then we have a modification because it's Herod's lust which leads to Yaokanan's death. So we have living death and felicité, in a sense, the absence of desire. And we have, uh, uh, and we have uh, uh, the, uh, the end of desire, if you like, brought on by Herod's lust for Salome in that other story. Well, you can say there's more than that, and this will be a transition to a rather different mode of looking at these things. Um, how about the fact that, after all, St. John's mission in life is to denounce desire. Uh, so in a way, uh, this is, if you want, this is a far more violent and active uh, taking of a position about desire than we have. We have no desire in felicité. We have uh, kind of mindless, bestial desire in Saint-Julien. Here we have the denunciation of desire, the coming into being then of of some form of moralism or puritanism or pro prophetic moralism. Uh, well, that would be the moment then to move along to uh, the discussion of this in terms of, um, in terms of speech and in terms of language. Because after all, um, uh, if this book is about, this book in some ways has to be about language and art, uh, if only again in that implicit way that it it's raises a claim to to use language and to represent something for us, and thus, uh, um, thus must be somehow uh, um, uh, be involved in a drama of language. Well, the, the one, the one full, uh, what this analyst called parole pleine, the one type of language which is absolutely full here, which is a language of presence, uh, is the prophecy of John the Baptist. And in a way, that's also the language which is the least successful because it's the language which is archaic, which is simply borrowed from biblical or invented or something, I mean, which is least realized for us, which is, however, um, transmitted to us on the mode of direct, um, of direct uh, representation. So, so we know that the final story is about a plenitude of prophetic speech and, 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 and about that in more ways than one, that is, Herodias, the, the, the hatred Herodias has for John the Baptist is, is a hatred of the prophetic word. Uh, she can deal with other things. She can deal with other forms of humiliation. She can deal with uh, weakness and, and uh, uh, with the military weakness and political uh, things and, and scandal and all kinds of things like that. But the word, she doesn't know what to do with. The denunciation of scandal, the prophetic word, uh, is uh, is somehow beyond her, her powers of of, uh, of recuperation, and therefore must be done away with. So the the prophetic word is given a very special kind of um, uh, uh, density here, and and uh, and weight, and placed at the very center of this. But of course, the prophetic word is an absence too, isn't it? I mean, uh, it's about the past. Uh, you you were like this before uh, the future, there will come a Messiah. 
But when you get to the present, it's still the past and future. Jezebel, you'll be destroyed and eaten by the dogs. Uh, it's about what will happen. It's about who will come. Messiah will come. But it's not about the present. So even in this prophetic language, we have a kind of flight from the center, a flight of presence, as Derek Dow would say, I guess. And, uh, and it unravels itself uh, uh, also, no matter how, uh, how dense and powerful it seems to be, as the placing of what Voloshinov in his book on Marxism and language calls alien speech. That is, uh, he has a long development, which is sort of interesting about how many uh, of most of the religious traditions really um, uh, are organized around alien texts in alien speech. Uh, that is, uh, the, the, Latin, the, the Latin Bible or mass, if you like, uh, for us or the Arabic text in uh, uh, the Arabic Quran in Turkey, say, or in, uh, in non-Arabic speaking countries, or, or whatever, uh, where, uh, where the sacred language is, is other, and therefore must be the property of priests, because they alone have the hermeneutic power, the, the, they have the monopoly on interpretation. Uh, they, uh, they have the sacred object, which is guarded by its, uh, by its alien and, and sacred quality. Well, St. John, uh, John's language is a little bit like that in this text. It functions as alien speech within this, uh, within this text. Well, then if we look back, we see that um, uh, this does not happen uh, earlier. That is, uh, we do have a, a, whole, um, a whole thematics of the, of the oral, but negatively. Felicité goes deaf. Felicite's ultimate beatific vision is visual uh, of, the, of the parrot as the, as the Holy Spirit and not uh, in terms of, uh, of language. Uh, and uh, also uh, Saint John, if you like, Saint, Saint Julien is called, his name is spoken, the charismatic thing or the, or the Althusserian interpolation, you know, Julien, uh, but the final vision is still visual rather than uh, rather than auditory. So, uh, so we have in the earlier texts a kind of uh, uh, if, when we put them together with this a kind of dialectic between the visual, the plenitude of the of the hallucinatory object, uh, and uh, some possible plenitude of possible or impossible plenitude uh, of language. And obviously, that's very closely related to the status of this of Flaubert's language itself. Can it become as dense as John the Baptist's prophecies? No, not anymore. Not, not in the modern world. Not with the kind of degraded language that we speak in everyday life. A language is riddled with uh, the, the Flaubert's your command, commonplaces and stupidities and, and received ideas and all of that. Commercial language. Uh, can it then uh, choose the visual? Can it become overwhelmingly sensory? Well, that's another, uh, um, and of course, not only the visual, because Felicité's experience is, is and Saint Julien's both is, is also uh, olfactory. She smells the incense uh, and so forth, uh, and physical and kind of three dimensional. Well, Flaubert's text does indeed, moving from this impossible uh, uh, quest of, uh, of a kind of dense, language, art language, the, of the kind that older art texts had, uh, moving away from that, tries to find a density in physical sensations, but that obviously is structurally impossible too, since really, you know, this is not going to be a, a Gesamtkunstwerk, and we really remain, remain alone with words. I mean, uh, it's, it's only insofar as words can convey this a whole dialectic of sensations which words can't really Overcome, and therefore that too is is um, uh, is um, a uh, is impossible, and this thing then turns turns around again and, and sends us back to its beginning. Now, uh, something else. This is a kind of sub sub uh, sub variant, I guess. Would be I just sort of want to list a few of these in, in, as um, uh, as. Um, to complete the, the, the picture. Uh, another way of looking at this would be in terms of objects. We talked about characters, we talked about events, we talked about language, what about objects? Well, we have the bric-a-brac of the modern world, 
Felicite's collection of old mementos. That's what the modern world breaks down into. Uh, and you end up with a few lock of hair from a dead child uh, 20 years ago, the, the, the portrait of the Comte d'Artois, uh, 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 this, that, and the other thing, and finally an, a stuffed parrot, which, however, among all this bric-a-brac, is a sacred object and suddenly begins to have a power that these other dead odds, pieces of junk and odds and ends, uh, which are the rubble of a life, don't have. Well. What's the equivalent of that in the other stories? Valorization of an object, uh, what's, well, if you think of the last story, then Herodias, if you look through it again uh, from this point of view, suddenly a whole part of the story uh, impresses itself on one's attention, which, uh, which one wouldn't have maybe necessarily noticed uh, otherwise. It's the whole descent into Herod's caves. It's Herod's treasure. That's the object world of Herodias. All of these marvelous things that are down there, and the riches, and also the whole, uh, the whole uh, legendary riches of Herod, uh, which even the Romans believe in. Herod keeps telling them, uh, you know, there isn't anything like that. But uh, everyone really believes it. Uh, all of his subjects, the Romans, and, and here we get a, we 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 go down, and finally uh, we find the uh, the very, uh, the ultimate. Um, Hidden object, which are the, the marvelous horses, which are which are somehow the uh, for an object world, they're as about as magical as one can get, right? That that is, if you're going to have um, if you're going to have objects which, unlike the objects of Felicite, which are valuable.